Over the past few weeks, we've been studying through John's Gospel, and today we reach the second half of chapter 3. Later on in the Gospel, in chapter 20, the uh, writer of the Gospel, John, tells us that the Gospel relates a selection of the life and times of uh, events in Jesus' life, chosen explicitly, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And woven into that narrative, John introduces us to several individuals or small groups of people and describes the interaction with the gospel and with Jesus. Last week we heard about Jesus' meeting and conversation with Nicodemus. And next week we'll hear about the Samaritan woman at the well. In today's passage we're given two short cameo portraits. One is of John the Baptist and the other is of his disciples. They're very brief and perhaps like caricatures, they accentuate certain features to characterize the subjects. And they, these cameos are then followed in the second half of the reading by a short passage that's filled with very profound teaching about the person of our Lord Jesus. And that serves as a commentary to try and explain and interpret the, the cameo portraits to help us to understand the people involved. So let's read together the passage. It's in John chapter 3, and it starts at verse 22, going through to verse 36. John chapter 3, 22 to 36. After this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside, where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Enon near Salem, because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, well, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this, John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine, and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The man who has accepted it has certified that God is truthful. For the one whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. Today I want to spend some time looking then at John and his disciples, comparing and contrasting them in four areas. Firstly, I want to look at their actions and what their actions tells us about their priorities. Next, I want to have a look at their attitude of mind, which sheds light on who their priority is. Thirdly, I want to look at their response to the revelation of God as it was given to them, And lastly, concentrate on their relationship with Christ. And for each of these headings, I want to turn to the uh, teaching that John gives us to show that the differences between John and his disciples can be explained and interpreted in the light of that teaching and that we need to apply that teaching to our own life. I'm going to start then with the actions of the disciples and John and what that teaches about their priorities. What business were the disciples engaged in on this day? 
These were exciting times in Israel. More than 400 years had passed since the last prophecy in the Old Testament from Malachi. And since then, there had been a remarkable period of silence in the history of God's people. No word of prophecy from God is recorded. And it's not as if the world wasn't changing around the people of Israel. When we leave them at the end of the Old Testament, in the 5th century BC, they were vassals of the empire of Persia. Now that great empire had long since fallen, but the people of Israel had remained under the dominion of foreign rule from Greece and then out of Egypt and out of Syria. And latterly, the great Roman Empire had emerged to complete domination of the Mediterranean basin. And what had God had to say to his people? Well, apparently nothing. That is, until John the Baptist had arrived proclaiming that the messianic era was upon them. Thousands of people were flocking to the Jordan to hear the teaching of John and to be baptized with the baptism of repentance. This was a major religious revival. And how do we find the disciples? Were they full of excitement and expectation of what the Messiah was going to do now that he'd come to deliver them? Were their minds turned to the eternal things, the great questions of life? Not a bit of it. They were engaged in a fruitless argument with the Jew about the relative worth of techniques of ceremonial washing. Now, it's known from some manuscripts found at Qumran that there were Jews who had a particular interest in the details of ceremonial cleansing. And it was presumably a theoretical religious discussion that the disciples were engaged in. And I don't know about you, but I find myself wanting to shake the disciples. Why bother with that? Just across the valley is Jesus, your Messiah. And you're more interested in discussions about religious ceremony, in secondary issues, unimportant details. And what a difference when we look at John, who explains his own sense of priorities using a parable a parable of the bride, the bridegroom, and the best man. Now, this would have been an illustration that was familiar to them because it draws on pictures from the Old Testament where Israel is described as the bride of God, for instance, in Isaiah 62. Now, in this context, the bride are the people, and the groom is Jesus, and the best man is John. But we can place ourselves in the role of best man to learn what it is to be a servant of Jesus. The best man is a friend of the groom, and in those days acted as an intermediary between the family of the groom and the family of the bride, working in negotiations, working towards their union in marriage. John then describes himself as the best friend of Jesus. He is engaged in promoting a relationship between the people and Jesus by proclaiming Jesus as Messiah. He's been encouraging his disciples to follow Jesus. And he tells us that his greatest joy and his greatest fulfillment is gained when he sees men turning to Jesus. And how can we explain these differences between John and the disciples? It seems clear that John's disciples have not grasped the magnitude, the importance of the events they were witnessing. They may even, may even have been trying to persuade the Jew they were arguing with of his need for a baptism of repentance, but they were focusing on the wrong thing. John appreciated that Jesus is God's Son, in verse 35, and that Jesus is the source of eternal life. Now that is a reality that would forevermore do away with the need for ceremonial cleansing, and it would forever do away with the need for daft arguments about religious ceremony. Or would it? Today we have the whole story of the gospel spread before us. We know that Christ died and that he rose again and we await his coming. And what would observant outsiders find us engaged in? Would they find us in a spirit of excitement, of expectation of what the Lord is doing and will be doing, focused on the need for men to turn to Jesus, 
or would they find a people absorbed in argument, controversy about secondary issues? Over the centuries, we know that there have been many examples of men who have a higher regard for their own traditions and their own agenda than they have for Christ. There are any number of examples that we could give, whether you're sprinkled or immersed at baptism. Ecclesiastical tradition, the form of worship, the form of liturgy. The list is practically endless, and every one of them has been, and still is, the source of dispute within the church. And it's of great importance to realize that if we dissipate or fritter away our energies on dispute, we will deflect ourselves from the task of being a faithful minister, a faithful uh, best man to Jesus. I wonder if you can think of someone uh, or some people who have been important to you in your spiritual journey. Very often it's a parent or a best friend who first awakes our interest in Jesus. And as I look back on my life, I can identify some key men who have profoundly influenced me. I think of my SU leader who organized a group of 12-year-olds to go away to summer camp. I give thanks for David Tryon, the man who led those camps in Anglesey for more than 50 years and who spoke the gospel to me clearly so that one night I gave my life to the Lord. I thank God for the men who have ministered to me here in the Tron, faithfully opening the Bible to me week by week. For these are the men that God has used to introduce me to the Savior and then deepen my relationship with the Savior. And we need to dwell on whether we are discharging our responsibility as best man. Is there someone at work maybe, or a neighbor, or perhaps someone in the family who is ready to be introduced to Christ? Has Jesus laid on our heart a mission? I have a mind to marry that person. Would you go and speak to them and see if they will come to me? Of course, this is not just through words. People are influenced to seek after Jesus in very many ways, in what we do, how we behave, what we say in everyday matters, as well as in explaining the gospel. And we have to remember that every single thing that distracts us from this task makes our mission as best man harder to fulfill. What are our priorities? What fills our time and our attention? Is it the world's need to come to know Jesus or have we become distracted by secondary issues? Next, I want to look at the attitudes of John and the disciples. And although the narrative is very brief, it's not too hard to discern that the disciples are not happy at the way the situation is evolving. It's possible that their Jewish adversary was poking fun at them uh, at the decline of John's group as evidence of some failing of uh, John's baptism. Whatever was said, it's clear that the disciples were irritated by the discussion because they come immediately to John, almost accusing him, as if to say, you know that man you testified about? Well, it's all going wrong. He's stealing our thunder. Everyone is going to him. And simmering just below the surface is a spirit of jealousy and resentment that stems from a misplaced sense of their own importance, where their own opinion, their tradition, their own group assumes great importance. They cling to John. They would have other men cling to John rather than go to Jesus. And what were they saying? That men would be better off staying away from the Messiah? They have become absorbed with themselves, inward-looking, and they've lost sight of the big picture. And now when we turn to John, we find a very different man. His character is marked by none of the peevishness of his disciples, but rather profound humility. He has no desire to remain in the limelight or to hold on to popularity or his own followers. He has accepted his calling unreservedly to be a voice calling in the desert to make the way straight for the Lord. And his humility is born of a deep understanding of who he is and who Jesus is. He recognizes that whatever success his own ministry has had, it has done so only through the grace of God. 
A man can receive only what is given him from heaven, he says. He sees that he is a man from the earth, a man of clay, unlike Jesus who is from above, from heaven. John came into a dark world. He was the focus of a great revival and he proclaimed that the day of the Messiah was near at hand. Like the full moon on a cloudless night, he shed light on that dark world and where before everything had been pitch black, men could see. But as dawn breaks and the sun rises above the horizon, the world is filled with blazing light. And Jesus fills the world with such shining light, he is the radiance of God's glory, the bringer of salvation. The moon is still visible in the sky, but it's revealed for what it is, the pale reflection of the sun, an object of beauty, but only visible because of the intensity of the sun. For what is the moon but for its ability to reflect the sun? And what are we but the palest, feeblest reflection of the goodness and holiness and righteousness of the Saviour? John had a vision of Jesus that was so large, so vivid, that he saw himself for what he was, a servant. He must become greater, I must become less. And he saw that Jesus' ministry would outshine his own as surely as the rising sun outshines the moonlight. Some years ago, soon after I qualified, I decided to take a break from being a junior doctor and I went travelling and I travelled in Nepal and I walked up into Tibet and found myself walking in the very remote areas of Tibet. And I was walking up the Rongbuk Valley towards a mountain called Chomolungma. And as I walked up the valley, the mountain peak stayed in view at the end of this valley the whole time. And I walked up the valley for more than two whole days. And as I walked, the mountain seemed to get larger and larger, hardly seemed to get any closer, until I was about uh, at an altitude of about 18,000 feet, and now if you think about that, that's the equivalent of about four Ben Nevis mountains, all stacked one on top of the other. And I realized that if I was going to get to the top of this mountain, I had another three Munro's worth of altitude to go. I was never going to get to the top of this mountain. It was huge. Now, I don't know if you've ever had that feeling when you're in a remote countryside, miles from anywhere, of the vastness of creation and how small you are. Well, I had that feeling then. I felt like a speck of dust in the vastness of the Himalayan wilderness. As you will have guessed, Chomolongma is the Tibetan name for Everest. And the closer I got to the mountain, the bigger it loomed. And the closer we get to Jesus, the larger we realize he is and the smaller we realize we are. How are we to apply these things to ourselves? Firstly, we have to look honestly at ourselves to see whether there's any envy or resentment or pride in us. And then we have to recognize that the origin of these things is self-importance, bitterness, stemming from a sense of wronging. I deserve an apology. Resentment at someone usurping our position. I deserve reinstatement. Envy, because I am entitled to that. And where we find ourselves taken up with jealousy or irritation or envy, we have found the spirit of John's disciples alive and well in ourselves. We have to capture John's sentiment that Christ should increase. In our corporate life within the Tron, we must cling to the centrality of Christ and we must flee from anything that tries to move Christ from center stage including all those secondary issues we mentioned earlier. Individually, we must increasingly bow our knee to Christ. For when we become a Christian, we name Jesus as Lord, but it's a lifetime for us to accept his Lordship 
in every area of, his, of our life. Now I want to move on to look at how the John and the disciples responded to the revelation of God's word that was given to them. And I wonder if you think I've been a little bit unfair on John's disciples. After all, this was the start of Jesus' ministry. They couldn't possibly have known much that we know. They didn't know that Jesus (coughs) was to be crucified, nor that he would rise from the dead. But by their own admission in verse 26, they identified Jesus as the man that John had testified about. So it's worthwhile recapping what it was that John had testified. And that's recounted to us earlier in the Gospel in John chapter 1. John had explicitly denied that he himself was the Christ. He testified that the Messianic era was approaching and that he was a voice calling in the desert, make way, make straight the way for the Lord. In chapter 131, he explains to his listeners that his role was to identify, reveal, and identify Jesus, the Christ. He had identified that Jesus was the man that God had singled out as the Son of God when the Spirit came down from heaven in the form of a dove. He taught that Jesus was the Savior who would take away the sins of the world and who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. And he had made it clear that in every single way Christ was superior to himself and that he was not worthy to untie the thongs of his sandals. In summary, he had testified repeatedly, clearly, unmistakably that he was not the Christ, but that Jesus was that Messiah. And how did John's disciples respond to this clear, unequivocal teaching? Well, almost inexplicably, it seems, They did not accept it or understand it. Now, we heard last week that Nicodemus couldn't understand what Jesus was telling him. He couldn't see the kingdom of heaven because he needed to be born from above. And in the same way, the disciples completely failed to grasp the significance of the message because their eyes had not been opened. John, however, is in no doubt. He confirms that Jesus is from heaven and that Jesus' testimony is not second-hand. He is not a prophet who merely repeats a message that's been entrusted to him. Jesus is not a messenger. He's the very author of our salvation. No, Jesus speaks from first-hand experience of what he has seen and heard in heaven. If you like, these are the conversations and thoughts um, of the conversations between God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as they sat in heaven. When we listen to a sermon, we hear someone talking from the Word of God. But these were the very words of God. And yet, John confirms, most do not accept Jesus' testimony. Now, the application to us in the Tron is clear. We are greatly blessed by sitting under faithful ministry of God's Word, and many of, many of us have done so for very many years or even decades. But it's possible to listen to such testimony from God's Word week by week without it sinking in. Just like John's disciples, we may even be able to relate what the teaching is. Remember, they knew what John had testified about. But it may have no effect on our life. And we may not pick and choose those parts of the Gospel that we, ha- that we feel comfortable with whilst discarding those parts that are difficult to understand. We don't always find it easy to accept that Jesus, in his conversation with Nicodemus, says that he who does not believe stands condemned. But those are the very words of God. And as we sit under the ministry of God's word, we need to pray that the Holy Spirit would open our spiritual eyes so that we might understand and obey its teaching. And lastly, I want to see how John and his disciples differ in their relationship with Jesus. For the disciples saw him as a rival. Everyone is going to him, they complain. Jesus was someone who threatened their own plans and aspirations. 
a man who was enticing followers of John away, such that their own band was dwindling. Now, it may well have been that these men were the leading lights of John's group. They may have served John with great diligence. It may have grieved them to see men leaving their group in order to follow Jesus. But their vision was too small. They were looking at the situation from a human perspective, if you like, looking through the binoculars the wrong way. They were reducing Jesus to the status of a human rival. John, on the other hand, saw Jesus as his Lord. We have already noticed that John believed that Jesus was from above, from heaven, and he understood that man's response to Jesus, whether positive or negative, was a matter of life and death. Literally, eternal life and death. And we read that John recognizes that the Father has placed everything in the hands of Jesus Now, as we sit in church today, it's very easy for us to conclude that the disciples were foolish. How could they possibly regard Jesus as a rival after all that John had testified about? But a moment's reflection should persuade us that we can too easily fall into the same trap. For all of us pursue godliness less than wholeheartedly. How many of us with Paul can say, that other than knowing Christ, we count everything rubbish. Have you ever heard yourself thinking that you could not do this or go there because of this or that? Maybe you're being challenged about the possibility of full-time Christian ministry, but how could you pay the mortgage? Maybe you're thinking of going overseas, but how could the children cope without a Scottish education? Maybe there's someone at work who might be open to the gospel. But how could you cope with the reaction from colleagues if you evangelized openly? We have many rivals for Christ. Our career, our material possessions, our standing amongst friends, neighbors, and colleagues. And yet our attitude towards these things is no less absurd than the behavior of John's disciples. If all things have been placed in the hands of Jesus, to whom should we turn if we don't have eternal life? To Jesus. To whom should we direct men who are searching for eternal life? To Jesus. To whom should we pray if we're desperate that someone should start searching for life? To Jesus. Jesus does not promise us success or popularity. He does not promise our physical freedom. Within a few weeks of this conversation, John had been imprisoned. He does not promise that we'll be free from doubt. When he was in prison, John was beset at times with doubt. And like John, some believers may lose their life in the service of Jesus. But later on, John received remarkable praise from the lips of of Jesus, who said that among men born of women, there has not risen any greater than John. And his greatness lay in his humility, born of his vision of the greatness and majesty of Christ. And if our heart leaps at the thought of receiving a word of praise from the lips of Jesus, ahead of success, ahead of popularity, ahead of freedom and even life, then we will have found the spirit of John alive and well in ourselves. Let's keep that in mind as we leave today. But Christ must increase and we must decrease. Amen. Our last hymn is number 150, hymn 150, Thou art the everlasting word.